Thank you. Thank you and welcome to the February 7th Dr. Cog board work session. I'm Wynne Shaw, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog and Chair of today's board, board work session. It is four o'clock and our meeting is now in order. I wanted to take a moment and introduce some uh, new members and alternates. Um, first, Justin Martinez from the city of Thornton. Uh, Ryan Schuhard of the city of Boulder. Christine Sweetland, city of Centennial. Kim Wright, city of Englewood. Roger Lowe, city of Lakewood. Shannon Lukeman Hiramasa, city of North Glen. Robert Ayala, city of Thornton. And Claire Carmelia, Carmelia, uh, or Carmelia, <laughs> perhaps, sorry about that, City of Westminster. Welcome to all of you and welcome to uh, the rest of our regular board members. Um, the first business in order is to open the meeting for a period of public comment. Melinda, do you see any hands for public comment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we can give it just a brief moment to see if there's anyone who needs to raise their hand. Great. Uh, and it looks like at this time, I do not see any hands raised. Thank you very much. Our next business in order then is the summary of the January 3rd board work session. Were there questions or changes? Seeing no hands, I uh, we will accept the summary as distributed. The next business in order is a discussion on the regional transportation plan and Metro Vision amendments. The chair welcomes Alvin Bidal Sanchez, manor, manager of transportation planning and operations, and Andy Taylor, manager of regional planning and development. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, chair. All right, um, you should be seeing the presentation in presentation mode. Um, if one of you could confirm that, please. Confirm. Yes. Perfect, thank you all. Um, I will be splitting this presentation um, between my colleague, Andy Taylor. Uh, I'll be discussing the amendments that are proposed to the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, and then I'll be passing it over to Andy to discuss the amendments that were also being proposed for MetroVision. Um, we are looking at a concurrent public review period, um, concurrent action later this year for both of these, so we wanted to make sure we got them before y'all, um, have some discussions, start socializing those before any further discussion or actions take place prior to public review periods, and then and committee and board actions. So I'll kick us off with our cycle amendments. Um, this is a process that we do in between our typical four-year update to our plan. Um, we do call it a cycle amendment process. Um, we can sometimes do this once or twice in between that major four-year update. Uh, we are looking for targeted revisions to projects in the plan. Um, because these are uh, targeted revisions, or even though these are targeted revisions, the amended regional transportation plan still has to follow all of our state and federal requirements that we have in place from uh, fiscal constraints, so making sure we can afford everything in our plan over the next 20 to 30 years, our federal air quality requirements, and the state's new greenhouse gas emission reduction level requirements. Even though this is an amendment, we are still subject to that requirement. During a cycle amendment process, we're really asking for three types of targeted revisions to projects in the plan, adding a project that might be missing that we need to show, removing a project, priorities, needs could have changed in the region and the community. Um, and then what we most often see, though, I guess when I show you these following slides, that won't be what we most often saw this last cycle, are major changes to existing projects. So those could be major scope changes. You want to change the limits. You want to change um, the description of the project, major cost or funding changes, um, recognizing that all of our projects are experiencing pretty significant cost increases, um, but what's reasonable to include in an amendment cycle process. And then completion year changes. Uh, we have three staging periods in our regional transportation plan. Um, do we need to move a project between those three if we think it's going to be done sooner? And we need to reflect that in the plan in our travel model. 
So I'm going to run through each of the ones that we are currently looking to process during this cycle amendment process. Um, I'll run through a quick overview of each of those. There are five. We did receive seven requests when we had our call for projects. Um, one was uh, not needed to be included just based on our regional roadway system. So it wasn't on that system. We didn't need to worry about including it in the plan. And then the other one we think we can capture during our next major four year update is we're doing some more coordination with our local member governments uh, and making sure we have a consistent and cohesive vision for the corridor that that request was on. So I'll start with 96th Avenue. This is a new project that we would show in the plan. It's from I-76 to Heinz Way. Um, I will note on all of these, the description is very high level. Um, we do try to keep this as general as we can for the regional transportation plan, but still convey the major improvement that is being constructed. Um, but for all of these, there are multimodal improvements. So in this case, while it is a widening from two to four lanes, there would be a new and improved bicycle and pedestrian connections. Uh, it's a $14.5 million project. We would show that as locally funded. Um, if you're familiar with our regional transportation plan, we have two parts. There's our regionally funded, which is funding that comes from Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, and then there's our locally funded section. So funding that toll highway authorities, local governments control. And this would show up in our 2020 to 2029 staging period. So where we currently are in the plan. Our second project is Colorado 7 from US 36 28th to 63rd. This would also be a new project. Um, we would be converting two general purpose lanes to business access transit lanes. So showing that project description in the plan. It is regionally funded for $150,000. Um, that cost is correct. You might be wondering why we're including a project with such a low cost in our plan with that. Um, that just comes back to some of our definitions around regionally significant projects. And so a conversion from a general purpose lane to business access transit, business access transit lanes um, for more than a mile in this case. So that um, is a reason we're showing this as a separate project in the plan and as part of some near-term improvements for the larger vision on Colorado 7. And this one would also be in our current staging period of 2020 to 2029. Havana Street at Lincoln. This is tied to the ongoing work at I-25 and Lincoln. It would also show up as a separate project, even though there are um, it's occurring because of that project. It would also be locally funded. Uh, the brief general description that we would include in the plan is a grade separation of both with safety, operational, and multimodal corridor improvements. Again, for this one, there would be bicycle and pedestrian connections, improvements, um, easier ways to move up through and across the corridor. Um, and this one would also be in our current staging period of 2020 to 2029. I-76 at Weld County Road 8 would be a new project. This is a request from Weld County. Um, this would be a new interchange at a cost of 180 million, showing it is locally funded in the current staging period. This one is contingent on approval from the TC on its 1601 process. So as it's a new interchange going through that state level process um, and making sure we get approval before it's shown in the regional transportation plan. And then Vasquez Boulevard at 60th is an existing project. Uh, the request is to move the staging period or change the staging period of the plan. So it's currently in our outer years. So 2040, 2050, working with the city of Commerce City and getting concurrence from CDOT. Uh, we think it will be completed within the current staging period as requested. So proposing to move that into 2020 to 2029. We actually started the cycle amendment process back in September of last year with a call for amendments. Since then, we've been going through our document development updates, our modeling, coordinating with project sponsors, um, our regional partners to make sure all these requests make sense. Uh, we are wrapping up the finalization of our documents right now. Um, we want to get those out for a public review period and stakeholder review period that will occur March and April. And then we'll be coming back before the committees and the board uh, May, April and May for uh, approval of the amended regional transportation plan. Um, for a cycle amendment process, while it is not our major four-year update, it can, still can take us six to nine months just to get through um, what are these targeted revisions to projects. And so um, we've been on this path since September with that call and are looking at wrapping up uh, this summer and meeting all those state accessibility requirements as well for our documents. So we've also built that into our timeline for the project. And I will pass it over to my colleague, Andy. All right. Um, thank you uh, for your time and attention this evening. I'd like to turn our attention uh, from the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan uh, to MetroVision, Dr. Cog's regional plan. I'm here to share three performance measure amendments that would be considered alongside the same timeline that Alvin just shared. Uh, next slide. Uh, MetroVision includes 16 performance measures. 
Uh, these relate to the desired regional outcomes throughout the plan, uh, which each represent a region-wide aspiration, uh, richly describing a future desired state. Uh, the measures offer a quantitative way to measure, to monitor progress uh, by identifying where we are as a region today and including a target for where we wanna be in the future. Uh, the measures are intended to provide a regional perspective and not intended to evaluate a jurisdiction or a project on its own, but rather to understand whether our collective actions are moving the region towards its desired outcomes. Uh, next slide. Uh, Dr. Cog has long sought to keep MetroVision dynamic and flexible uh, this extends to the approach to performance measures. To track many of these measures, Dr. Cog staff rely on external outcome-oriented data. Uh, we knew uh, going in uh, to this uh, document that uh, methodologies and approaches uh, to these data sources could change, and so uh, that would trigger the need for an amendment, but it doesn't necessarily change the desired outcome in the plan itself. Uh, next slide. Uh, so MetroVision has two performance measures that are related to high-risk areas. Uh, one is specifically related to housing, and one is for employment. Uh, we're bringing both to your attention for potential amendment because of new methods uh, changing the underlying data that we rely on. Uh, next slide. Uh, these two measures consider risks related to uh, wildfire and flood. Uh, upon adoption of MetroVision, these measures relied on wildfire threat data from the Colorado State Forest Service. It reflected uh, conditions on the ground as of uh, assessed in 2012. Uh, the Colorado State Forest Service continues their work in this area per to periodically analyze wildfire risk, uh, knowing that ground level fuels and conditions do change, uh, but they have changed their methods and they no longer offer the wildfire threat index that our uh, MetroVision performance measures currently rely on. Uh, the Forest Service does have alternatives that Dr. Cog staff have uh, considered, and the proposed amendment uses their burn probability, uh, which offers a different coverage on the map based on a different methodology. And so I'll show those, uh, next slide. Uh, here's what the highest categories of the wildfire threat index look like in informing high-risk areas. So this is what we used when we adopted MetroVision and adopted this performance measure. So currently, the high-risk performance measures look at houses or, or employment located within these wildfire threat areas and, but not shown here, also the floodplain. Um, and they look at those as a share of the region's total houses and total employment. And so to see how that's changed, uh, the highest categories in, in the newer burn probability map cover more of the region than the threat map did. But just remember, this is a new, a different new methodology from the State Forest Service, not just changes in the on, on the ground conditions. And so that's triggered a need to reconsider our baseline. So next slide. Uh, the changes proposed are update both the baseline uh, uh, for housing and employment in high-risk areas. Uh, the proposal is to move that baseline forward to 2020 to align with the vintage of the data from the State Forest Service. And but because that, uh, that starting share or percentage uh, is different, the proposal uh, also includes uh, new targets. But these targets would be calibrated relative to the new baselines. Uh, still reflecting the same proportional change between the baseline and target that we currently have in MetroVision. Uh, next slide. So here you can see what those changes uh, would look like with strike throughs and underlines. Uh, sorry about the missing underline under 3.7% there. Uh, but again, it's proportional to the change in the share for uh, the existing target. Though it does account for the fact that we've only got about three quarters of the time left by bringing that baseline forward to 2020 and with the target year remaining at 2040. Uh, so next slide. Uh, unlike the, the first two measures, uh, this third measure amendment proposal uh, to the traffic fatalities measure is not the result of new uh, data or methodologies, 
Rather, it's about recent board action and guidance, and I'll pass that back to Alvin to speak more directly to, to those changes. Thanks, Andy. So we include this uh, performance measure and target in MetroVision as the number of traffic fatalities. Um, we do collect this data. We're not proposing the data is changed. Um, the actions that we are referring to are the board's adoption of taking action on regional vision zero. This was back in 2020. It really changed um, our, our vision, our methodology for future fatality targets that we've done in other processes here at Dr. Cog, um, recognizing that um, as we, we've noted in other presentations, loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. And we really tried to um, bring this, this vision, this methodology into our other planning processes and projects. Um, we've also, following the adoption of taking action on Regional Vision Zero back in 2020, uh, worked with the board in late 2020, early 2021, to determine what might be an appropriate horizon year for achieving zero traffic fatalities and zero traffic serious injuries in the region. Um, we ended up doing a Mentimeter exercise, seeing what made the most sense for our region, recognizing um, at the time how many of our local member governments had Vision Zero plans in place um, or similar systems, recognizing the varied aspect of all of our different communities, uh, what made the most sense. And so based on that guidance, based on taking action on Regional Vision Zero, uh, we are proposing a change to both the baseline and the target. Um, the baseline was set for 2014. We're proposing to bring that up to 2020, just reflecting that new shift in our, our vision for the region in terms of traffic fatalities. So we would reflect that baseline value of fatalities we saw in 2020 versus 2014. And then our target would shift from being fewer than 100 annually, which we had been aiming for prior to taking action on Regional Vision Zero being adopted to zero. Our target year is proposed 2040, coming out of that previous board guidance that we um, had solicited and, and received and have used in our other um, planning products as a horizon year. That concludes our presentation, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Justin Martinez has his hand raised. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I actually had a couple of questions. Uh, the first question was about the the burn rate, the the burn probability um, data. If you go back, at, Andy, you might have explained that, but um, the the baseline and the target is dropping by 0.6% now, but previously the target, the difference was 0.2%. So why are we, I mean, what's the reason for increasing that that percentage drop? We're looking at uh, the housing or the employment one here? The uh, I'm looking at the housing. Okay. Um, sure. The We're looking at, um, so the percentage point drops, what we looked at were, um, we were looking at the percentage decrease that we were, uh, targeting between that original 1.1 uh, uh, and less than 0.9. And so we were trying to achieve uh, about a 22% decrease between 2014 and 2020, realizing that we've only got about 77% of the, the years uh, of the time left. Um, we have revised that to be about a 17% decrease. And so that's what we're trying to keep in mind is uh, the, the, the percent decrease, not, not in terms of percentage points. And I, Thanks, I it may be helpful also that the baseline is actually driven by uh, actual results that are incorporated. Is that correct, Andy? Yeah, the baseline uh, for 2020 would be looking at uh, new household. Um, yeah, so we'll be looking at the new housing data as of 2020. And so, yes, we have tended to be growing in areas. Uh, uh, so under the existing performance measure, uh, the using that existing coverage, um, we were already experiencing some decreases. Um, under that smaller uh, footprint of coverage. And so, yes, it is uh, somewhat also related to some changes in the built environment over that time. So does that help, Director Martinez? 
It does. Thank you. I, I, I had uh, one additional question, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Certainly. Okay. And that was about the uh, vision, the traffic fatality target um, being set to zero. And um, I understand I'm, I'm a new board member. So I, I could you provide a little explanation to the reasoning behind setting such a, you know, absolute target? I mean, zero means no fatalities, which a lot, oftentimes, even when you have perfect mitigation, you've got you do your job perfectly, accidents happen. So how can we justify having a target of zero in that case when a lot of th times these things are beyond our control, even when we do our best as, as uh, you know, planners and, and uh, yeah. No, I appreciate the question. Um, so this work, taking action on visual vision zero, some of our um, pre preceding safety work, um, after safety work from that. Um, we really based that on what we felt was our priority for the region in terms of safety. Part of this was also um, engagement with the public. Um, we actually ended up doing a video uh, education campaign with them um, asking like what made sense and really the the target zero, zero traffic fatalities, zero serious injuries, no one being killed on our roadway as they're using it, moving through our transportation system. Um, when we just ask the basic question, how many people should die on our roadways every year, that that's a what what's a, acceptable to the region, and I think zero is where the public was pushing us, where where the board at the time was pushing us. Um, we want this aspirational target to be able to make the transformative investments that we want in the region to improve safety, improve mobility for all ways people are traveling through our region, recognizing that we might not always achieve zero, but making those significant transformational investments, we can make great strides in in our larger vision for a safe and multimodal transportation system. Right. Okay. And I think that helps to say that in this particular case, this is not a calculated target. It's more of an aspirational target. And Alvin, you did a great job highlighting that. If it's all right, uh, we'll move on and recognize Director Levy. Uh, thank you, um, and thanks for the presentation, both of you. I actually had questions on each of the three areas. Um, Madam Chair, is it okay if I ask each of those questions, or do you want to take it section by section? Uh, I, I would say section by section. It's probably easier. Okay. Well, so the the first, just going in the order of the presentation on, on the changes to the, um, the projects, the addition of the projects, I was wondering whether, in addition to the scoring that you that you had on the screen around greenhouse gas reductions, um, I'm, I'm on the wrong page now, but um, um, vehicle miles traveled, effect of vehicle miles traveled, and then also effect on mode split um, between multimodal, um, you know, bike pad. Uh, versus single occupancy vehicle. Do, do you analyze it for those factors as well? For the cycle amendment process, we didn't get that far down into uh, data comparisons because this is a, a cycle amendment process in between the four-year cycle. Um, we did want to ask some questions around how it aligns with our existing priorities in the plan. So there, there were prompts for project sponsors to respond to how will this improve safety? How will this improve multimodal mobility? Um, how will this improve freight, active transportation, um, and air quality? So we did keep it at a higher level, um, recognizing this is a regional plan and it was um, a shorter cycle amendment process for us, so not a full four-year update. During the four-year update, we do look at a lot more data points, um, and we do provide that information to our re review panels that are looking at projects. So there could be scores around our performance measures, um, Metro Vision, federal performance measures, uh, what are congestion scores with these projects looking like, um, what are staff scores using using Metro Vision's themes and outcomes that we want to achieve in the region. So that would be uh, the forum that more more data comparisons come into play when we're looking at that. Okay, so and I'm still, you know, three years into this, I'm still understanding all the processes and and how things get scored and funded. And so I just I, I'm asking that question just because, you know, are we putting projects on the list um, through one process, which is are going to make us uh, further out of compliance, say on the metro, on the Vision Zero plans or 
um, on any of the other components of Metro Vision. So that's, I'm just trying to understand right. you know, whether we're actually bringing all those goals together. Yes, uh, we are. And um, part of uh, this process is, is like, like I, it's noted on the slide, we do still do our federal air quality conformity model running, model runs, as well as our state greenhouse gas emission reduction levels. So even though we are adding these new projects or proposing to add these new projects to the plan through this process, um, we still do have to show to our federal partners and our state partners that we are improving air quality in the region. Okay, thanks. And then I also have a question on the um, housing and employment in high risk areas. I think Andy, this was your section. Um, on the, um, so we have the baseline on both and then we have the target and we're trying to reduce housing and employment in high risk areas. Are we, um, are we, what are we, how are we proposing? Is this, is this a land use conversation around where does housing and employment go? Is it a risk reduction, um, uh, conversation around what steps are we taking to mitigate uh, wildfire risk or, or or a combination of both or is it neither just to show you know that we live in a risk prone area so um, it's a mix of both really that there are multiple ways that the region can achieve these measures and so some of this can be by by growing uh, outside of these high risk areas so as the region um, grows more in um, uh, the areas that are outside the high-risk area, uh, areas, we would see these shares decline. Um, but also because uh, these uh, these coverages, these areas, are um, updated periodically by the Colorado State Forest Service, that there could be some changes in, in ground-level conditions that could change some of that risk profile as well. So. We recognize that, that there are multiple ways um, that this can be um, that this can be achieved, and the the way this is, shows up inside MetroVision is through uh, the initiatives piece, where there are voluntary initiatives that are listed off for uh, local governments, for different regional groups, uh, and and other stakeholders uh, that include some of those types of things, where the policies may may come into play here, but um, so that's where uh, that does those pieces do show up inside MetroVision. Okay, and the, I guess part of what was prompting my question is, you know, for instance, in Boulder County, we have our Wildfire Partners program, where if you're if you're if you have a buildable lot and it is in a high wildfire prone area, then you have to take mitigation measures and and work with our wildfire partners to um, reduce that wildfire risk. So. You know, it may be mapped within that area, but we're, we're hoping that we're reducing the the actual risk at that location, which is probably a more granular level than than this plan can get into because it's so much of a lot by lot basis. But I, I think, you know, I guess I wonder with this and also with the Vision Zero, where, you know, we have, yeah, we have a target but we don't really have the tools to achieve that because it depends on local governments doing things or not doing things. And so um, I guess it's just for all of us member local governments to look at that and see that number and say, gosh, are we, are we contributing to this problem or not? So I understand why we would have a baseline just to say this is the level of risk that exists within the Dr. Cog area um, I don't understand the logic of of a reduction target when, oh, we might achieve it by having lots of growth outside these high risk areas. And so it, it changes the percentage, but it doesn't change the number of people who are at risk. So I don't know. It's I have a, a bit of a disconnect on that. But, but thank you. Um, I did have another question, but I'll hold it for later. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Director Douglas. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. I hopped up a little bit after four, so I didn't see the previous uh, presentation. What is that about the burn area? And I noticed that that is north of the Rocky Mount Wildlife Refuge and pretty sized. Is it there? Uh, can you 
breaking up a bit. Madam Chair, <clears throat> I wonder yes. if we can just put him back in the queue and and okay. uh, hopefully we get we'll that. Try straight. try again. Uh, Did you not get that? Oh, there you are. Yeah, we, okay. we well, lost we cut out. most of. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> I was asking about in Commerce City. I see that orange burn area. Is that because of the Rocky Mountain Wildlife Refuge? That, or can you explain that? Why that orange is the way it is on the map? Yeah. So um, the analysis by the Colorado State Forest Service does account for what um, what is on the ground uh, in those locations. And yes, there are um, that analysis is taking into account um, some of what would be on the ground um, uh, in Rocky Mountain. Uh, arsenal there so that that would be um what is driving some of that and then there's additional factors in their methodology that are um uh factoring in a lot of different uh variables as well so um but that is uh the the ground cover in that location is coming to play yes so does, so that, does, does that hurt commerce city when it comes to Funding for different projects, whether it's housing or other types of infrastructure. Um, we're looking. We're trying to keep an eye with these measures at the big regional numbers, so um, it isn't something that is factored in um, in um, uh, specific decisions like that. But trying to keep an eye on the overall uh, regional number. And okay, thank you very much. Thanks. And there's also an attempt to share kind of share information. So what you know may help you in your planning, uh, but not, uh, you know, but Dr. Cog's job is trying to uh, be the resource for us. And uh, so Colorado State Forest Service is the expert and uh, we'll try and uh, each take it to our planning divisions to uh, uh, to see what can be done. Uh, Director Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you both for the presentations. Uh, Andy, this is more directed towards you in regard to the burn probability map. We'll keep it up here. Um, obviously with what happened in Superior and Louisville and the fires, the, a lot of that was spread by wind. Um, or over sustained amount of time, um, obviously, and sparked with whatever, however the fire started, um, that those results have come out as well. Um, it would be helpful to probably get the Colorado State Forest Service methodology to kind of help our own individual municipalities to take a look at that, see what's going on, because obviously you really can't mitigate wind per se, um, but but um, but mitigate the fuel that that wind could could spread um, because we're here in Erie. Obviously, we're close. Um, our population has grown since 2020, 11,000 people. And so that risk level, I think, would also go up um, because of the amount of people that we do have. Um, and so just something about just want to get more information about that would be very helpful. Um, and also the methodology um, from 2020 to 2024 is there updates that are provided incrementally over the years, if there's dramatic spikes in, in population growth, that it might impact something like this? Sure, I'll start with um, getting more information out. Um, yeah, that is information that, that we can um, point to um, with the Colorado State Forest Service. They provide an interactive map and an atlas, but there's also a, a really in-depth technical methodology um, that they have as well. Um, but but one thing your your comment is is helping me think about is is maybe we periodically will do idea exchange panels, Metrovision idea exchanges, and that may also be a good way to highlight some of the work that people are doing in this area. But maybe also bring in some of the experts from the Colorado State Forest Service, see if invite them to see if they can speak on that some of that as well, since um, it 
it is uh, pretty in depth. The, the amount of factors they are really bringing in, and and uh, the information about uh, winds and prevailing direction, and and just the statistical analysis and the rigor they put into it is really impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. In in terms of um, uh, changes over time, um, I do know that there has been. Um, one uh, iteration, uh, so this was what we were seeing with the 2020 high burn probability map is from their 2022 report. There is mm -hmm. some lag in their an analysis as, uh, um, as one might expect uh, of, of just doing uh, this type of work. But um, there, I think there was uh, one between, so, so what we had looked at um, for Metrovision originally, I think was from the 2013 report. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one report uh, in between those two. So, so between the 2022 report and the 2023 report, there was another one in the middle as well. Um, there are changes that come into play there. They offer a rich set of other information that beyond just this high burn probability map, and they have an extensive atlas as well that is trying to look at things like the wildland urban interface. And so, uh, that is where some of those changes related to population, some of the uh, uh, where structures are, that's where some of those are also going to be factored into their work as well. So um, I, th I think what they tend to post is just the most recent, not necessarily change over time, uh, but that information um, is a great resource, yes, and I agree that that could be something uh, we could look into sharing more. Yeah, I think it would help for our planning departments. And for instance, what where we zone, what do we zone, what where are the the problem risk areas that we do have, um, because we are growing so quickly, uh, and the amount of people that we have is is um, uh, they're still coming to Erie is 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 a lot. Um, so it would be very helpful. So I appreciate it. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Spear. Thank you, and thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just had a question around the Vision Zero section, but it, it's it's a, maybe a little bit broader than that. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, traffic deaths have nearly doubled in the past decade, um, which seems like a concerning trajectory, especially as our region continues to grow. Um, and I think this question, the bigger issue that it's getting to is Director Levy's point about what leverage we have to influence regional goals when local decisions are a primary factor in whether or not we achieve those those goals. Um, is there a way that we can ensure that we put more funding into safety projects in the next decade? Because um, it seems like funding is really going to be essential to change this directory, in particular around the Vision Zero goals, and make sure we're moving, reversing, and then moving back towards zero. Thanks. Yeah, there are a number of uh, options we're looking at to improve safety in the region. One is um, since the introduction of the BIL, Dr. Cog has attempted to um, explore the creation or the the submission of a regional SS4A grant, Safe Streets and Roads for All. Um, we've also supported local member governments in their own um, submissions of those. I believe in one of the last two cycles, 10 of our local member governments received grants to make their own safety action plans, their own Vision Zero targets, what's appropriate for their community. Um, our Safety Regional Vision Zero Planner is also right now uh, wrapping up an update to taking action on Regional Vision Zero, um, recognizing that some of those actions, those initiatives, um, those priorities that we had in the plan in 2020 might have shifted since then. And so she's been reprioritizing what are those tasks we could be doing at a regional level, we could be doing with y'all could be doing within y'all's communities, what resources we can provide to y'all, um, recognizing that not all communities are equal in this, in this space in terms of resources, staff, where they are in their safety journey. So there are a couple of deliverables that we've built into the Taking Action Regional Vision Zero plan that we'll be bringing before y'all later this year um, that uh, hopefully get to some of those additional resources that are aiding local member governments um, in, in improving safety and getting some investment um, built, built changes on the ground. Um, one of those other uh, Deliverables actions has also been an exploration of how we can increase safety funding in the region, whether it's through our tip, whether it's through coordinating with other partners to um, create that source, leverage other sources. And so there are um, a number of actions in the updated plan that will be before y'all later this year as well that we're trying to bring that to the forefront in various avenues. Great, right, thank you. Thank you. Director Kondo. Yes, uh, I have two questions. Um, first of which I think is mostly addressed by uh, prior uh, folks that asked and, and going back to that, uh, the heat map of burn risk. I was wondering if obviously that's Colorado Department of Forestry, but 
<clears throat> is that also correlated in any shape or form with fire districts? Because I know fire districts do their own risk assessment. And I'm just thinking to myself that, you know, more data is better. I'm not aware of whether the, the State Forest Service incorporates that level of risk assessment. I know that there's, there's other entities that are doing this type of risk assessment for um, insurance purposes and whatnot, but um, this is just, I, I, I'm not familiar whether they, they account for um, some of that local fire department information in their methodology. Okay. Well, I, I'd ask that maybe we, we kind of peel that back a little bit and <clears throat> understand that. Um, I, I just think that, you know, you have the forestry service and they characterize how fires burn in forests, but how fires burn in neighborhoods are different. <clears throat> or for that matter, in wild urban interface areas. So it may be useful to be informed about, you know, what is that threat assessment uh, with some additional information that, that can be brought to brought to bear here. Um, my second question has to do with the first presentation. And I, I can understand zero being uh, a big hairy ass goal. Uh, to use the term from one of the consulting management consulting gurus, but um, I, I wonder if we've tried to benchmark in any shape or form uh, highway deaths in other uh, COG areas that we could just look at to figure out how they've tried to characterize, you know, uh, a goal that is achievable uh, and practicable. And in fact, maybe it's maybe it's not highway deaths per mile, but it, it could be maybe a reduction in the number of deaths that occur over a certain time horizon. Right. Um, I'm not aware of any recent efforts to look at what other um, COGS and POs like us are doing in this space. Uh, when we did adopt taking action on Visual Vision Zero, we were one of the first, if not the first MPO, to have a Vision Zero plan like this and a, a, a goal of zero in the region. Um, but since then, there have been other MPOs that have that have reached out, wanted to know what our methodology, how we came to this space, how we came to this conversation in the safety space with with the public, with our board members. It could be something that we look look into. Um, to, to benchmark with other regions, just at a national level, I, I think we've all been seeing those increases in traffic fatalities, serious injuries across our roadway network. Um, so that just we're in line, at least at a national level, with unfortunately those disturbing trends on our roadways. Thank you. And the patient, Director Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have... I guess two quick questions or comments. Um, my first one is related to the project amendments. Um, Director Levy kind of touched on it, but I have concerns about you know like prod like the I seventy six interchanges that we're adding a new interchange when our whole intent is to reduce vehicle miles traveled and reduce congestion. When why are we adding? these types of improvements, I'll say, to our highways. So that's just a comment. Um, my question goes back to the um, high fire threat maps, the burn probability areas. Is there a concern with either Dr. Cog, the uh, <clears throat> State Forest Service, um, or any other entity that, let's say a decade from now, um, we'll see an even larger burn probability more on the Eastern Plains portion um, rather than like 2012, we didn't have most of Boulder County and parts of Jefferson County that kind of start to transition to that urban interface from the foothills that's predominantly grass. Uh, I'm not familiar with any uh, forecasting that they're trying to do as part of this work to try and understand uh, potential changes to, I, I think the biggest variable in there would be the ground level fuels um, and whether those would be uh, drying out further or whatnot and creating more risk or hazard. Um, but I do know they are considering a, a lot of different factors in there, but I'm, I'm not familiar with any work that they're trying to do specifically to, to, to look ahead um, to those types of variables, but it is work that they are continuing to, 
to to look at and update periodically to hopefully stay on top of that um, in the future. Okay. Thank you. That's all, Chair. Thank you. Director Mulvey. Hi, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address what Director Ward's question was about why we need more lanes or why we need an interchange. I can share that I-25 is an interstate with respect to logistics moving product. And so even if you were to stay off the road and have things travel to you by way of delivery, we still have those users of the road. In addition, in some parts of our region, parts of Jeffco, eastern parts of Aurora, of uh, Arapahoe County, and a large part of Douglas County, there's no rapid transit that's available to accommodate the amount of people that need to get to work, school, and other places. And so it may be regrettable for some, it happens to be a reality. There's no uh, bus or very few shuttles. And so we do actually need to accommodate those changes to the road and that road maintenance. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Director Mills. Yeah, I'd like to also concur with the previous statement. Um, that area, I live like 15 minutes away from that uh, proposed new interchange. There's a six mile stretch between interchanges from the very north end of Brighton all the way to Hudson. And there are there's no uh, public transportation in that area. And so there is a need to have interchanges available and especially for public safety. And as that area grows into Lock Bowie and those areas northward, they they will have to be able to get off the highway maybe sooner to get to maybe some first responder um, needs in that area. And let me make another comment um, outside of this. I see this burn area here. As this burn area in the orange has increased to be you know bigger than the previous map you had up, do you think that is a contributor to why everyone's homeowners rates are higher because there are more wildfire risks in the area? Um, it's difficult for us to know um, what, because this was a new methodology. Um, it's hard for us to compare the, whether there was more risk or not, um, because it's, it's, um, they're saying the highest levels of risk, um, the highest wildfire threat in a different index. So it's hard for us to directly compare them um, to, to say that there's there's growth in risk. Um, but um, it, it is a risk that is out there for folks. And I, I know it is related to to that cost that a lot of folks are, are facing. So, uh, But I, I don't know that just based on comparing these two maps that, that I can speculate directly on that now. Thank you. And Director Mulvey, your hand is raised. Perhaps she had meant Sorry. it down. <laughs> I did mean to take it down. Thank you. Okay. That's great. Well, thank you, Alvin and Andy. This was really a helpful presentation. Our next business in order is a presentation on the 2050 uh, Regional Transportation Plan and 2024 Mitigation Action Report Overview. Uh, the chair welcomes Jacob Rieger, who's Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Mr. Rieger, the floor is yours. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, good afternoon, directors. Can someone confirm that you're seeing my presentation in presentation mode? It is... Uh, the preview slide is to the right and the oh. presentation slides to the left. Okay. My apologies. Let me, let me try that one more time. Not sure why it did that. I know sometimes they do it. It reads a presentation and thinks that they're not seeing your screen. <laughs> okay. Um, is, is that better now or is it still the same? Yes. Looks good. Good. Okay, great. 
Um, thank you very much. I uh, wanted to give you an update on our um, transportation greenhouse gas mitigation action plan. Um, this is now an annual exercise that we undertake. Uh, we did this last year. This will be our second time this year. Um, so for some of you, this will be a little bit of a review. And for some of you, this will be brand new. So let me start a little bit with um, kind of our framework. We've already kind of touched on this in the previous presentation about um, our obligations for the Transportation Commission State uh, Transportation Planning Greenhouse Gas Standard uh, that we now need to uh, comply with through our regional transportation plan. Um, I like silly analogies. So the silly analogy I'm gonna use here is a layer cake. Um, this layer cake is showing the strategies that we undertook to update our plan back in 2022 to become compliant with the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Planning Standard. I'm not gonna go through all of these today. I am gonna focus on that bottom one, uh, which is the mitigation measures and our mitigation action plan. Um, sorry for the math here. There's a bunch of numbers, but basically um, what this is showing is both the requirements in the greenhouse gas rule. Um, these are all million metric tons. These are actual amounts of things. These are not percentages. These are actual amounts. Um, so it's showing the requirements under the rule and it's showing kind of our work, showing the math of how we got there. I'm not going to go through all of these numbers, but suffice to say that basically, again, using the layer cake analogy, it's showing... Um, kind of the steps that we took, kind of where we started, the techniques, the strategies, the things that we did, kind of building and building like that layer cake to get there to show compliance. And at the bottom, kind of the middle of the table, but the bottom of the analysis is the mitigation action plan. You can see that it is small amounts in mitigation action plan, um, but very important. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. You'll also see that we actually don't need the mitigation action plan to achieve compliance with the greenhouse gas reductions until the 2030 analysis year. Um, that will also become uh, important later in this presentation. But this is the table that we included in our updated plan. Um, and it's basically to just kind of show for transparency the work that we did and that, yes, when you put all these things together, including our mitigation action plan, we do comply uh, with the reductions required of us in uh, the greenhouse gas rule. So in terms of the mitigation action plan uh, background, a uh, couple things here. It is needed as that last step to close the remaining reduction level gap. So that's kind of the point two of the previous table. We did all of these things through our plan, through our model, through our technical analysis for 2025, we did get there. Uh, but for 2030, 2040, and 2015, you know, we still had that kind of very small gap to close. So the mitigation action plan helped us to do that. Um, it documents the region's approach to using mitigation measures, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, reports and analyzes measures at the regional level. This is very much a regional analysis, so I'm going to overuse the word regional to make that point um, because it is regionally anchored in our plan, um, and that's the requirement under the rule. However, we anticipate that implementation would occur in a small fraction of our region in those kind of strategically appropriate uh, kind of areas or applicable geographies. Um, and again, I'll touch on that too, but it's basically, this is not a one size fits all. Uh, where do these measures, um, you know, where do these measures make sense? And then finally, ample opportunity to implement successfully over time to help achieve compliance. That is the point that we don't need it for 2025. Um, it doesn't really kick in until 2030. So we have some time to experiment um, and to adjust and course correct over time. Um, a little bit more on the background of mitigation measures. Um, for us, they are policy-based, not project-based. And really what that means is that under the greenhouse gas rule and the requirements of the rule and the accompanying what's known as Policy Directive 1610 uh, with CDOT, Policy Directive 1610 lays out a whole series of mitigation measures that can be used um, to help achieve compliance with the rule. Some of those are project-based. Some of those are infrastructure-based. Uh, we were able to account for those in our plan, in our modeling, in our technical analysis. So we did everything we could kind of in that plan environment, the technical environment. So when we still needed to do a mitigation action plan, what remained for us um, were more policy-focused um, types of measures, which I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and so that's why ours are in particular policy-based and not project-based. Again, measured regionally, but implemented locally. Mitigation measures, this is a very important point, are voluntary and they're not required to be implemented in any specific location. So to be clear, the requirement is that because we are using a mitigation action plan to achieve compliance with the rule, we need to report on mitigation measures. And as the MPO, we have the obligation um, to kind of report each year, how are we doing um, on achieving mitigation measures, but the actual deployment of them or the implementation of them by local governments is completely voluntary. 
As I've said, they can be adjusted over time based on implementation status, um, but also, as I said, annual reporting is required when you have a mitigation action plan, which we do, CDOT does as well. So both agencies need to transmit annual reports on our mitigation action plan to the Transportation Commission by April 1st of each year. So our mitigation measures, let me animate this slide through. Um, we have um, these categories of mitigation measures. So everything else I'm going to show you as part of this is million metric tons, except for this slide where these are actual amounts because they're small. Uh, we're showing them in their actual metric tons, not million metric tons. As you can see, as I said, these are policy focused. So they're things having to do with increasing residential or job density, mixed use transit oriented development reducing or eliminating minimum parking requirements where that makes sense to do so, and adopting local complete street standards, right? So um, these are the measures that we selected for a mitigation action plan. And we did this pretty intentionally because these aren't new things in this region. These are things that you all and we all collectively have been doing in this region uh, for a number of years. And we wanted to build on that planning framework um, for mitigation measures for things that you know, we can, you know, we have that framework in place and we can continue to build on uh, to help achieve compliance over time. Um, so let's shift to the actual report that's required of us each year a little bit. Um, there are five required elements. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. You can see them on the slide. Um, the point is that these apply to each of the mitigation measures. So each of the measures I just showed you, we have to go through this exercise to talk about kind of the status and the completion and, and you know, where these measures are at or if they've changed um, or if something has happened with them. We need to do that exercise for each of the mitigation measures in the mitigation action plan. Oops, sorry, there we go. Um, actually, I wanna make sure that I didn't skip a slide. Okay. Yeah, so um, as we have started to get into this work, so a little bit of um, a little bit of schedule reminder here. We, um, we had our state requirement under the greenhouse gas rule to revise our 2050 regional transportation plan to achieve compliance by October 1st of 2022, which we did. Um, the board adopted the revised 2050 regional transportation plan in September of 2022. And then this new requirement kicked in to report on our mitigation measures by April 1st of each year, which was April 1st of 2023. So we had about six months to turn right around and try and start you know, reporting on this work, right? So now we have another requirement again, April first of this year um, to do an updated report on our mitigation action plan. So as you can imagine, we're at the beginning of this journey, and we've spent a lot of time both this year, last year, and this year to really think about kind of that framework, right? How do we track these mitigation measures? Where does the data come from? Um, how do we establish our baseline? How do we track this stuff over time? How do we show progress towards implementation? You know, there's a lot of questions here that as staff, we're, we're trying to work through. As indicated on the slide, you know, this is potentially very sort of resource intensive. Um, so that's something we've been thinking about. How do we do this in an efficient way? Um, how do we make this easy for us and easy for you? Uh, what does adequate progress look like, as I said, over time? Um, defining the baseline and change over time, some of what you heard in the previous presentation, some of the considerations that go into that. And then an important point in particular, because these are primarily land use oriented mitigation measures, Again, these come from the specific mitigation measures that were available to us in Policy Directive 1610 as part of the rule. And the way that those measures are structured is that they are um, policy changes, not development activity. So the actual measure that we're trying to track is when a local government takes an action to rezone um, an area, you know, like, you know, again, residential rezoning, um, job um, employment rezoning, um, what have you. So it's the rezoning action itself, not the development activity that may or may not occur as a result of that rezoning that we're actually trying to capture and measure. If you're a little confused by that, that's kind of the point, right? It is what it is. We're trying to comply with that. Uh, but again, it's a change in zoning, not the actual development activity uh, that's a trigger for us in terms of tracking these to show compliance. Um, the other big piece of this is local government outreach and support. Um, again, this is all voluntary, as I said, at the local government level, but for local governments who are doing this work, who are interested in doing this work, and who want support from us to do this work, we are making some commitments to provide those staff resources and other things that we can do to kind of help you if you're interested 
um, in doing this work. Um, we've been meeting with local governments in our MPO work program, which I'll touch on the next slide. We've actually put in some language around helping local, local governments with mitigation uh, mitigation measures and um, implementation. So kind of an open question here that we've started talking with you all already, but we'll continue to talk to you um, both together and individually is what resources and supports to interested local governments need um, to do this work. And then the last point I wanna make about all this that yes, we're trying to comply with the rule. We are in a sense trying to check a box, but it's really much more than that. As the slide says, leveraging data and processes for multiple efforts and good planning. Again, the whole framework here is that we're already doing these things in this region. We wanna build on that work. We want to have good planning in this region together with you. We want that work to count, not just to show compliance with the rule, but to make the region a better place to live and work. Um, so finally, for um, our report this year, this particular version of the report, the 2024 report, um, a few things that we're focusing on in particular, um, as I alluded to, our unified planning work program, which is our metropolitan planning organization work program um, that shows our staff activities and resources. We purposely put in activities related to mitigation measure implementation. Um, so we want to include that work in the report and kind of what we're building on through our unified planning work program. Um, local government actions related to mitigation measures, even if you don't think you're doing it, you might actually be doing it. Um, I will single out my friends at the city and county of Broomfield who proactively came to us last year as Broomfield was updating their parking requirements and parking standards. And they said, you know, hey, we're interested in this from the lens of the mitigation action plan and the greenhouse gas rule. And we actually worked with staff in Broomfield to kind of do an analysis and see, you know, what they were proposing, what that would look like um, under the mitigation action plan. So that was a really good sort of test drive exercise for them and for us. And we're interested in continuing to do that kind of work. Again, I mentioned our local government outreach efforts, which we're continuing to do. Um, as you know, we um, have our Dr. Cog Equity Index that we've done a lot of work as staff over the last year and a half, two years or so. Um, that becomes important for the disproportionately impacted communities um, component of this work, which is a requirement under the rule. Um, so we want to bring some of that equity index work into it as well. And then we want to acknowledge, of course, that you know potential legislation in this legislative session that in the future may affect some of these mitigation measures or may affect kind of our workflow on this. Wouldn't change anything for this year's report due April 1st, but at least keeping an eye on as we're building towards the future and building towards implementation of these measures by 2030, how could potential legislation over time potentially change what, you know, what we're doing or how we're, um, how we're building towards that. So with that, um, that's all I have to present to you today. I will sort of end by saying that this is an administrative staff function, doesn't require board approval, um, but we wanted to be transparent with you and kind of show our work as we're putting this report together, uh, which we're in the process of doing now. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any input. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Reeker. Are there questions? Yes, Director Levy. Thank you. I'm sorry to be that that person who always has their hand up. Um, that this is this is something, Jacob. Thank you for the presentation. I, I have just struggled so much with the whole concept of of this mitigation action plan and how how we take credit for for policy changes, as you point out. Um, policy that doesn't create developments. So I guess because of that, I have maybe two fundamental questions. One is, um, you know, is exactly that, like conceptually, um, if our, will you track reductions in metric tons based on the policy change, regardless of whether there is a development consistent with that policy change, or would it be tracked when there is development or something that actually, you know, materializes in a reduction in, in metric tons of emissions. So that's, that's a question I have. And then the second is um, knowing, you know, we're feeling like, okay, we're, we're in the clear until 2030. Well, you know, it, it takes years sometimes for things to actually come to fruition. Uh, when there are policy changes, or even, you know, let's take Broomfield's example of reducing uh, parking requirements. Well, until the, until they have a lot of a certain critical mass of development with with a, a lower parking ratio, 
lower part, you know, we're not going to actually be able to show that. So at what point are, are you tracking, I guess, I don't know how to ask this question. Are you tracking like when, how far in advance of 2030, when we actually have to show some results, do we need to start seeing some action? And so, you know, we may be saying, okay, we don't need to have uh, show results from our mitigation action plan until 2030, but maybe, maybe like right now, we actually need to be showing that we're putting the policies in place to produce those results. Sorry for such a long question. I just can't phrase it any more concisely. No, I appreciate that, Director Levy. And, and frankly, we have asked ourselves those same questions and struggling with those same answers. So let me attempt to provide an answer, but with you know, with the caveat that, you know, this is this is complicated and there are there are no easy answers. I'm going to answer both your questions somewhat the same way by first saying that, you know, look, I want to acknowledge when it comes to Policy Directive 1610 and the work that went into it, you know, this is hard stuff. If it was easy to measure and easy to do, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. That said, you know, you raise very good questions about kind of local government, uh, rezoning actions, development actions. And to be quite frank, we, we hope to... Um, well, let me answer it this way. It turns out it's actually easier to track built development than it is rezoning changes. And we don't want to be in a situation where we become sort of a rezoning, you know, accounting bean counter, right? Boulder County took a rezoning on a piece of land. Does it qualify? Was the piece of land big enough? Was the rezoning action appropriate enough? Does it, you know, does it count as part of our mitigation action plan? And to do that, you know, for 50 plus local governments, that's a really hard thing for us to do, it's a really hard thing for you to do. It's actually easier for us and for you to track actual development activity than it is to track kind of rezoning or, or some of these policy land use changes. So my point about 1610 is that over time, we hope to influence changes in 1610, which is a document that was meant to be updated over time um, as we try to apply some of these methodologies and find out, you know, we have this kind of data or not, you know, and not that kind of data, or we're able to do it this way and not that way. We actually hope to bring to bear some of the issues that you're raising um, kind of in your questions um, about what we can actually track and what makes sense to track to actually affect meaningful change. And that gets to the second part of your question about parking requirements. Yes, it's hard to tell. It's hard for, you know, an individual jurisdiction, right? We all kind of do our parts. It's a little bit like our Metro Vision goals. No single jurisdiction is going to achieve our Metro Vision goals for us. It's going to take collective action across the region, which is why that these are measured regionally. But because the actions are taken locally, it does put us in a position of kind of having to kind of aggregate those over time and show like, well, are we making adequate progress? And that's going to be hard. It's a hard exercise to do. Thankfully, because we have until 2030, we are able to kind of reflect a little bit. We'll also be updating our uh, regional transportation plan starting the summer. So we'll have another bite at this apple for sure. But over time, yes, it does give us the opportunity to think about what is the most logical way, the easiest way to kind of structure this that we actually can show collective action over time. So I probably didn't answer your question, Director Levy, but I hope I at least shared some of our thinking around it. Well, you, you definitely did. And I guess I would just, you know, the part the part about the parking wasn't to to comment on the value of that as a policy, but it was that um, you know, we actually don't have until 2030 because we have to be putting policies in place now that will yield some results in 2030. And I and I don't see that in um, I mean, this is not intended to be an exhaustive analysis, but that's going to be a really, really hard thing for, for you to factor in is like when, how far in advance. And I, I don't know how to ask the question any, any better than that. But and then the other the other piece of it is so with these metric ton reductions, um, it's not like we're going to take, say, low density, high greenhouse gas emitting um, development patterns and abandon those and all the people that are in those are going to move into nice uh, mixed use walkable high dense low greenhouse gas emitting communities they're they're going to we're still going to have those communities and the, these new lovely highly desirable places are going to be occupied by new people by growth yeah. that in and of itself brings more greenhouse gas emissions, no matter how well designed it is. So I, that's just another complicating aspect of this whole uh, calculus to me. I, I don't envy you, and I'm sorry that you're having to do something you could characterize as heart stopping. <laughs> Thank you, Director Ward. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jacob, for the uh, presentation. I just have a couple uh, questions. This is, I think, my second time seeing the components to achieve reduction levels for greenhouse gas emissions and, and whatnot. So I just have a couple questions, and this might also help some of our newer members um, who may have not seen this before. When you talk about the 2050 uh, Regional Transportation Plan update modeling, you talk about network updates and programmatic funding and observed data. What do you mean by like, network updates for, uh, updates, for example? Yeah, thank you, Director Ward. So um, again, coming back to kind of this layer cake and, and the things that we did, um, we knew that the, to comply with the greenhouse gas rule is going to take several things, right? It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't just going to take one or two strategies. So um, we did a lot of things here. Um, to answer your question directly, the network updates refer to, uh, we did make a few project changes in the regional transportation plan. Um, and we actually did this work in conjunction with a cycle amendment process, um, just like what Alvin described in the previous uh, agenda item. Um, so we did make some changes to projects. Um, now, again, you know, individual project changes, hard to, hard to kind of show that regionally, but it's the plan as a whole. And so we were you know, pretty strategic, but we did make some changes, some important changes to projects in the plan, as well as all these other things in the layer cake, which have to do with some of our investments in the plan that aren't project specific, because we don't show every single project in the plan, right? We have categories um, of investments of things that um, are actually a lot of money, a lot of fiscal constraint in the plan, uh, but have not yet been turned into projects. Uh, we did make some near-term land use adjustments um, and some of the other, you know, some of the other things that you see here along with the mitigation action plan. So it took all of these things for the revised 2050 RTP to comply, uh, the regional transportation plan to comply with the greenhouse gas rule. Does that answer your question, Director Border? It does. Um, and I, I have a second question that I want to ask. You keep mentioning that this is all um, voluntary. There's no, Dr. Cog has no teeth per se uh, in which to force a local government to do a certain land use or um, any other policy change. So my question goes into, since Dr. Cog is the one creating this plan, and Dr. Cog does not have the teeth, where what happens if we don't meet these greenhouse gas emission reduction goals? Um, that's my question for right now. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So a couple of things here. First, remember, and let me come to the table to sort of make this point. You know, we're focused today on the mitigation action plan, which is one slice of the layer cake. Remember that our compliance, as you just asked in your first question, you know, accounts for all of these things that we do as part of the plan process. So over time, we're going to continue being thoughtful about the projects in our plan. We're going to continue to try and capture the greenhouse gas benefits of the non-project specific programmatic investments in our plan. Uh, we're going to continue to have you know, the most updated land use forecasts that we can and all the other things that go into this. So again, the mitigation action plan is just, you know, that very important, but that small sliver to help us get there. But specific to the mitigation action plan over time, again, if we find that, you know, maybe maybe one or two of the mitigation measures aren't being implemented, you know, with the frequency or the level that we thought um, that they were, we can adjust those, right? We can um, we can have other mitigation measures do more. We can bring in new mitigation measures potentially. Maybe we'll find that you know one of the mitigation measures is really popular and, and there's more activity around that than we thought there would be, and we can account for that too. So I guess the point is that hard to talk specifics in a hypothetical scenario, but we do have, to use a cliche, some tools in the toolbox, both around adjusting the mitigation action plan and all of these other things that you're seeing on the table and in the layer cake that's part of our compliance strategy for the plan over time. Okay, and then my last question is: When you um, when you do all these calculations, are you factoring in every jurisdiction is taking some piece of this puzzle and incorporating it into their master plans, or are you factoring in that some may not do as much, some may do more, some may not do as much, do any? Uh, what does that calculation look like? Yeah. And let me come back to the mitigation measures here to answer your question. When it comes to our overall compliance and all the other pieces of the layer cake, that's our regional analysis and our plan and our model. So that's not, you know, that's not jurisdiction specific. Again, it's a regional 
analysis looking at our entire metropolitan planning organization area. When it comes to these mitigation measures, no, we have not done that. You know, we have not said, well, Broomfield updated their parking requirements. We need three more jurisdictions to do that. Or we need seven jurisdictions to do it at this level in order for it to count. So this is not a jurisdiction specific, um, you know, sort of calculation. What we did do to set these, these levels in the plan, the, the metric tons that you're seeing is that we did do a geographic analysis of the areas, the geographies in our region where these might make the most sense. For example, mixed use transit oriented development around transit stations, right? What, you know, what could that look like? And we tried to account for what's there today versus what could be there, the increment of change in the future. And we said, well, you know, here is a level of change um, over time that we think would be appropriate. And kind of the same thing with some of these other ones, but it's not, it's not parceled out or accounted out um, to a jurisdiction by jurisdiction activity. Okay. Thank you. There's uh, really helpful to clarify. Really helpful to clarify how you guys factor in all of these different techniques and what goes into that calculation. So thank you. Thank you. And I know that Director uh, Papstor had a stand up, uh, as well as Executive Director Rex. Did either of you wish to make a comment? I'll defer to Ron. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Chair Shaw, Jacob, Jacob got to the point of the, the analysis that we did just to evaluate sort of opportunity where these mitigation measures we thought could be implemented in some way. It was a relatively conservative analysis, as Jacob said. We were not being overly aggressive. We wanted to be realistic on that. And um, just, just to amplify one thing that Jacob said uh, in response, I think, to Director Levy, we were handed a menu of of available mitigation measures we could choose from. We were not able, we were not allowed to create our own or make our own mitigation measures. The mitigation measures menu was given to us. And so it did tie our hands a little bit um, to what we could do. And as Jacob said, I want to amplify that. We continue to engage with CDOT and other stakeholders to see if there are ways to improve the mitigation measures menu and the analysis and the tracking process as part of the policy directive to make this more relevant and um, a better implementation tool for us. So thank you. And I might add uh, that to a certain degree, you know, as we true up this projection to actual events, we may actually find that some mitigation measures, as you mentioned, are more popular uh, uh, or, or have a greater effect than we thought or were more highly adopted. So I, I think, uh, you know, we're kind of early in the process here. So I think this was, at least to me, very informative and, and I appreciate that update. Executive Director Rex. Uh, you are on. Yes, I'm muted. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Uh, I'm I'm forever impressed with uh, Jacob's ability to articulate uh, articulate a very complicated process. So, Jacob, wonderful job as always. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention was Jacob did mention that this is prime. This is really a, um, a staff administrative function. Um, but when we are ready to submit this to the state, that we will also share the report with the with the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. So as we did last year, I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very, Very helpful. Meeting. Thank you. Are there other questions or matters from members that we should address? Hearing none. Uh, our next board work session is scheduled for March 6th, and our next uh, board meeting is in person on February 21st, so I look forward to seeing everyone there. It is uh, 5.18 uh, p.m., and we are adjourned. You get another 10 minutes back. Thank you for another great discussion.